Thanks for having me. This is just so fun. I, I love one of my favorite things about doing this show is that I get to meet people that I would not have otherwise met. And I come across books that I might have missed. And it's just always such a pleasure to find new authors. So I do have to tell you, one of the things that I absolutely adore about Kyle's new book, which is called Everyone Knows How Much I Love You, and it is not by way uh, a romance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you were expecting that, well, it, anyway, we'll talk about that more in a minute. One of the things I absolutely adored is the language in this book. I love beautiful writing, and that is something, Kyle, that you just totally have down. So um, one of my questions is, how long have you been working on this novel? Because it certainly doesn't seem like something that you would have just, you know, zipped off in mm -hmm. six months or something like that. Um. I mean, first of all, thank you. I think every writer wants to hear that their Absolutely. language is beautiful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's the thing that we're like all vain about, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I worked on Everyone Knows How Much I Love You for four years, which actually for me felt like kind of a short amount of time. Um, and when I wrote it, I was really trying to get away from obsessing about my language so much. So the first few drafts I actually wrote pretty quickly and mm -hmm. consciously tried not to be sort of overly fussy, but right. um, I guess because I do love beautiful writing, a lot of the last year or two was about really cleaning it up. Cleaning so, it up and polishing. Yeah. yeah. So, so four years. That's it. Now, did I see, and I, I'm, I might be off base on this, but I seem like I remember that maybe it was based on a short story that you wrote first. Is that true or? This, yeah, it's, it's almost true. It's um, I wrote, I wrote a short story and I loved the voice of the narrator so much that I wanted to spend more time with her. So the short story is about tutoring and the novel also has a narrator who does a lot of tutoring of wealthy kids. Right. Um, but they're not exactly, the short story is not inside the novel. It sort okay. of grew from it. Yeah. It grew from it. So, um, and, and you had written short stories before you wrote the novel. So you have some, actually some some stories that have won some awards for you and things I think I'm I'm hoping that I'm right about this I was like <laughs> I was speed reading and then I forgot to write it down yeah no 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 you, you are right it's um I think um actually the story that grew into the novel was also a story that was um selected for best American short stories which was really felt like a dream come true um sure. because that collection is just it's something that I try to read every year. So I was so honored to be included in it. Yeah, well, and, and that's so awesome. So let's talk about the book um, because obviously that's that's why we're really here. Did, do you have a copy with you? Can you show I us? Do. I do, I sort of put a copy in the background a little bit. <laughs> no, I love, I love your background. I love your window oh, and your thank tree. You. Thanks so much. That's perfect. Um, yeah, here on the East Coast, it's getting on towards twilight, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, here. Oops, let's see if I yeah, can get it's always the, trying to get in the window. Yeah, here. Um, here is the book, and uh, yeah, it's called "Everyone Knows How Much I Love You." And and like I said, it's not a romance. Um, the the love component is a little dark and twisty, and a little bit of a oh, well, not even a little bit of a way. So let, let's talk about what it is about. Can you tell us a little bit about what? what the story of this book is about. Sure. Oh, and before you do that, I'm gonna tell you real quick, we have a um, we have one of our listeners here, Annie, who's awesome, by the way. Hi, Annie. Uh, hi. Annie says, I've been dying to read this. Um, uh, yeah, you're you. good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, tell us about the book. Sure. Um, the book is a, a lot about uh, repetition and compulsion and betrayal. So it follows a young woman named Rose, who when she's in high school, she betrays her best friend. She does the thing you really, really should never do to your best friend. And the friendship falls apart. The two women become estranged. They don't speak for 12 years until they cross paths in New York City. And they're both 30 and they're both trying to become artists of different kinds. And Rose, because she is so obsessed with what she did in high school and still can't understand it, she warms her way back into her friend's life and they start living together they start throwing parties together 
And then things get weird and complicated. <laughs> weird and complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the thing is, we are so in Rose's skin in this book. That's another thing that was so incredibly well done is that you just, you're on this journey with her. Sometimes you don't necessarily even want to be on this journey yeah. because it's not comfortable, but it is very enlightening and um, fascinating story. So the other thing that was interesting is that Rose is an author. And she's writing a book that is very much about what happened that she's trying to figure out. So she's also trying to make sense out of her life and her experiences by this sort of autobiographical novel that she's writing. Um, yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah it's so um, it's interesting. My mom is a therapist uh -huh. and is um, really interested in um, like narrative psychology, which sure. sort of asks people to examine the stories they tell about their lives. Right. And so it may seem like a little bit of a gimmick or a little too cute to have a main character who's also writing a novel, but I think what it allowed me to do was to think very overtly about the stories that Rose is telling herself about her life. Oh, sure. No, I didn't think it was cute at all. Mm -hmm. I, um, um, I, <laughs> cute is not a word for this book. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's fascinating to me. I'm also a counselor, by the way. I never told you oh, that. So, so I, I have that kind of background. I'm interested in that the stories that we tell about ourselves. And so that was, that was a very interesting um, play out for all the characters in this book who are all unraveling very different stories that get interwoven with each other. Um, now I have a question for you. Um, what was it like growing up with a mom as a as a psych you know a psychologist for a mom though? I mean, did that <laughs> <laughs> Did that mess with your head sometimes? Or was she the awesome to just stay out of your head, leave you alone? Or is that something that you want to just move on mm -hmm. from and not address <laughs> at all? <laughs> um, I, w I will say I have, so I have three other siblings and probably all four of us would answer this question differently. Yeah, I think. based on personality for sure. <laughs> yep. Um, but the joke growing up in my family was definitely that you never got in trouble. You just had to talk about it, right? <laughs> Like there was never, I used to wish that I would get grounded because uh -huh. it seemed sort of like glamorous and exotic, but I never got grounded. It was always just like sitting down with my mom and being like, why do you think you did this? Were you secretly angry at us? Like, <laughs> but- um, And it would have just been so much easier to get punished and be able to move on, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, but I think it was maybe actually great training for writing because- oh, yeah. it, from very early on, there was just an attention to relationships and dynamics and uh, how we act out what's going on inside our heads, so. Right, absolutely. Oh, I think, um, I mean, for me, for being a counselor myself, it's brilliant training. I mean, I, you, you get this insight into how people work and why they do what they do. And as a writer, yeah, you absolutely want to know all those things. Um, yeah, <laughs> it takes yeah. you places that that other people may not may not go, um, which which is one of the things that is brilliant about this book is that it really it's very subtle in some ways. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you you get me inside her head. <laughs> like yeah and sometimes it's a scary place for rose to be you know in, yeah. inside her own head yeah it's interesting to me i think some people have the reaction of like oh rose is sort of a villain or she's um a, a nightmare or something um but i think a lot of other people sort of have the reaction of like oh there's something a little tragic about her because she's self-aware or she's paying attention to the world outside her but she's also kind of missing a little bit of self-awareness so she can't quite help herself yeah yeah it's almost yeah it's it's an interesting i, I don't want to talk too much about it because we don't want to spoil it for mm -hmm. everybody who's gonna, who's gonna read this um but yeah there is that element of you can't think of her really as a villain because she's not necessarily deliberate in some of the things that she does it's um playing out playing out a story <laughs> in some ways and so yeah fascinating stuff so her her uh tutoring was very interesting so i do have a question did you ever do any tutoring i have did, you been a tutor? <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes so that came from a really real place 
<laughs> yeah, I spent, um, I, I think about seven, seven or eight years tutoring. Um, oh, you lasted longer than Rose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, but it also was, I mean, it's, if you want to talk about another job that's great training for a writer, oh, yeah. people are literally inviting you into their homes. And, you know, I, I mean, I think people who clean house or do childcare also sort of experience this invitation into the domestic space. And it's often people are not really paying a lot of attention right. to you. They just miss you. you. You don't really, you know, you don't really count. You're in the background and you right. don't matter. So you get to observe right. all kinds of things. Right, right. And I think especially with tutoring, you see parents acting out their anxiety and putting pressure on kids and kids pushing back. And it's like having a front row seat to the family drama. So um, maybe I kept the job because it was interesting, even if it was also a little awkward at times. Well, and it would depend on what kind of kids you were working with. So, you know, Rose's students are very privileged, uh, upper class, um, yeah. maybe kind of looking for the free ride kind of kids. Um, it, it, it would depend, I think, totally on what kind of, what kind of, have you worked in different types of tutoring or what's been your... You know, I've done, I've done a, a little bit of a range, but I have to say my experience is very similar to what's in the book. Like I mostly did very high-end tutoring. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and it, you know, if you want to talk about sort of wealth inequity, it's like, it's also, that's the type of tutoring that really pays the bills. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are, yeah. you know, there are what's being charged for tutoring is the same as like high-end lawyering or, you know, therapists or it's like kind <laughs> right. of shocking in, in New York City, so. Right, well, I, for someone like me, everything is shocking in New York City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. there last summer, I went to uh, the Romance Writers of America conference and uh, it just, it blew me away. I'm a small town girl. Normally if I go to a city, I'm going somewhere like Seattle, which is not up. It's, mm -hmm. it's, to me, it seemed crowded, but it's still pretty much on the ground. In New York, the way everything is in high rises and um, all crammed together, it, it was very interesting. It was fascinating. Yeah, it's a whole different. Yeah, it's a, um, it's an intense pressure cooker of a place to live. Um, although, as you can probably guess from my background, I. I was there for a few months in the spring and then summer came and I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll go visit my parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get some, get some space, as you're saying, some, some trees. Right. Now, um, another thing that I found interesting was uh, your main character, Rose, she went to a prestigious writer place, uh, the Iowa is, uh, tell me what that is. I think you, you were yeah. there too, right? So yeah, the Iowa Writers Workshop. That's what I was trying to think of, the Iowa Writers Workshop. So again, you're writing about something that's familiar to you where you can pull on the experience. Can can you tell us what that even is? I think a lot of a lot of us are not as familiar with that experience. Sure, sure. yeah. It's um it's a MFA program. So uh -huh. um, but I think what's sort of distinct about it is that it's the oldest writing uh MFA program in the country and also one of the largest. So They've become so popular in recent years and you can study fiction writing for a master's degree at a lot of different places. But Iowa is where this whole idea that you might be able to teach fiction writing or that there would be value in getting together to workshop your uh -huh. work um, first took hold. Right. So, and, and how was that? And again, I'm thinking that might have been like really competitive. Like, you, you know, was it supportive or was it kind of a stab you in the back kind of a competitive environment or? I really didn't. I mean, I think the nice thing is that there's, um, there's 50 fiction writers there at any time. So uh -huh. it's sort of large enough that you can find your group. And of course, some people are kind of ambitious and, sure. but I think there's, there's a negative side to that, which is that it can be intimidating, but there's also a positive side, which is that it makes you really want to bring your best work. Absolutely, um, sure. Oh, I'm a competitive soul. I totally, <laughs> I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it was funny. I, I vividly remember uh, calling my parents in tears, um, you know, maybe mid-September of my first semester because everyone was just so unbelievably good. And I thought, 
I don't belong here. Like mm-hmm. I don't have talent. Like I can't, how can I even, you know, I'm getting blown out of the water. Um, and I think there's something very powerful for me to experience that kind of intimidation and then to think, no, I do have something to say. And it may mean that I just really need to work hard and read a lot and write a lot and really sort of give myself over to this craft. And Iowa gave me the space to do that. So I feel very grateful for my time there. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And it's wonderful to hear about it. I always, I wanted to do something like that at one point. I I ended up, um, well, my story, I finally, went back to school because I did nursing first and then I got married mm. and then was taking one class at a time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a four year degree. We're going to, we're going to do something where I can get an English degree. And I actually, I had signed up. I was supposed to get to work with Michael on oh. oh yeah. Oh, and I was all excited about that. And then he was off on sabbatical that year. <laughs> <laughs> writing the English patient of all things. And, and I got somebody for my person that I really did not get on with. So that's the other flip side of how those things can go is you can have, you know, a writing uh, mentor who's not a good fit for you at all, um, which was fine. Actually, I learned a lot and, and, you know, obviously didn't hurt me all that much because I kept writing, but, but that, that, pressure that you're talking about of seeing what everyone else is writing. It's also inspiring. You know, I I think there's something really about having other people around you who are writing and you're sparking ideas off of each other and talking about things. That's, that's just a, what a wonderful thing to be able to spend time just doing that immersed for a while. Yeah. Uh, So where did you grow up? If not in New York, where where are you from? Um, Well, as I've, Grew up in uh, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia, which is okay. also like the yeah. protagonist of my book. Um, which is funny. It's as some people have said, "Oh, were you nervous putting in so many autobiographical elements?" But I don't know if you find this. Uh, I always find that place is the hardest thing to kind of fake your way through. Um, I just. You know, I could have sent my protagonist to school in Nebraska, but I've never been to Nebraska, but I've been to Iowa. So it just felt, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way about setting? Well, absolutely. Uh, most of my, most of my books uh, that I write as Carrie Ann King are actually set in Colville where I live. Oh, so I write books and set them in a small town. And if they're not here, I set them, you know, somewhere close by places where I can go that I know fairly well, like Spokane or Seattle. Um, because yeah, it's so evocative. The, the place where your character lives, they need to know the streets and how it smells and what yeah. the traffic times are and where the best places are to go and eat and what the culture and all of that. And so getting that, if you don't live there, I think is very difficult. Um, yeah. I know I have friends who do it, mind you, like historical fiction writers. I, I don't know how they manage to pull that off with the with the level of skill that some of them do, but, but it's pretty amazing. Yeah. To me. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, even I think like what the trees look like or what the air smells like, yeah. or, you know, all of that stuff is just when you're looking for telling details, it's nice to have the authority to be like, this is what Twilight in Spokane looks like. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, I set one of mine in Seattle and I go there every now and then, but not enough. I, I had to go mm-hmm. spend a couple of days. I had to pick a neighborhood, go be there, walk the street, mm-hmm. go to the park, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, because otherwise, how can you capture that? essence, I guess. I mean, okay, so New York, when I went to New York, I was blown away by the fact that they stack garbage bags out on the sidewalk. I was like, what? How, how is this? Everywhere else that I've been, there are dumpsters that everybody puts the garbage in and then, the you know, so things like that, I would have totally missed if I was trying to set something yeah. there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> One of the more poetic details of New York City. Yeah, yeah, garbage right? on the street. But it's important if you're going to yeah. if you're going to write there. And so y- you've been able to set your book there, you know, beautifully so that we're there through the eyes of your character. Um, yeah. So, OK, so here's another thing. So <laughs> you've written a novel about a girl who grew up in um, how do you Swarthmore? Is that? Yep. 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 
and to tutors, privileged kids, and went to the Iowa Writers um, Program and is writing a novel. <laughs> and it's really just a little bit um, dark and does some things. So do you ever have anybody react to that by looking at you with a little bit of, you know, <laughs> fear, fear and trembling? <laughs> I, th I think maybe sometimes there's some sidelong glances, uh, like, oh, is that, is, that, is that you? But I think, I mean, I think the funny thing is that most people who know me, I'm like a pretty, um, I don't think it's out of turn to say that like I'm a pretty mild, warm, I'm like, you, I'm a pretty even keeled person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that's fun about fiction is that you get to take things that are maybe just like a passing thought through right. your mind, you know, that happened once in the middle of the night and really sort of blow it up and expand it. And right. I think and hope that most people who really know me know that that's, that's what's going on. <laughs> right. The people who know you, but you're right though. It's fun. Like, um, I get to play with things in all my books that are not really me. And in my Carrie Schaefer books, uh, I go really dark in those sometimes. So mm. they're, they're more uh, mystery, paranormal mystery. And, I, and I've had my significant other, my Viking, will actually look at me. He'll be reading along. He'll just look at me and go, you're scaring me. Mm. <laughs> like, if you only knew what goes on inside my head. <laughs> right. I mean, that's great. I feel like if someone says you're scaring me, you're like, yes, yes, <laughs> I'm doing my job. Right, right. It's good. It's awesome. Well, so what about some other things about you? Do you have any like fun little story that you can mm. tell us about you growing up or in the recent years or anything like, oh, and I almost forgot if you have your book, I'd love for you to read a page for us. So yeah. um, let me forget that. So story first, if you have something and then. Sure. <laughs> well, let's see. I was thinking a, a little bit about it. And, um, you know, I've, I've, of course, I've been thinking about how I became a writer and what were my sort of early influences. And one story I remember is that um, when I was in fourth grade, I think that my sister, like, ate my Milky Way bar that I had saved. And it That's just... A big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, sweets were hard to come by in my household. And I just lit a fire in my belly and I was so angry and I got on my bike and I took this bike ride through the little town of Swarthmore and I blew off steam and I was like, you know, riding everywhere, everywhere. And when I came back, it was like all of this energy had just been released. And I wrote a little story about it and read it to my fourth grade classroom. And when it was over, one of the boys said, that is the most boring story oh. I have ever heard. <laughs> but I think what's funny about it is that I was, I was self-assured enough that I just was like, Sam Lathrop is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love girls that age. You know, it's funny when we're young like that. We, a lot of us, are super confident. We don't get this doubting our skills thing until. Yeah. You know, we hit teenage years and we start looking around and we don't measure up and they worried about the boys and all that stuff. But yeah, I don't I don't know if you remember um, reviving Ophelia, the book. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was a book that kind of hit the shelves just as I was entering adolescence. And if if people watching don't know or don't remember, it was a book that sort of contrasted the confidence that yeah. pre adolescent girls have yeah. raising yeah. their hands in class and playing sports with the sort of turn inward and sometimes very self-destructive behavior that teenage girls can get into. Right. And I actually think it was something I was pretty interested in in writing about my writing my book. Um, part of why Rose is fascinated by her own adolescence and then also tutors a girl who is in her adolescence in 2015, you know, 20 years after Rose or 15 years after Rose. Um, I don't know, I was really interested in thinking about what happens to girls when they go from the ages of 10 to 15 and how that change really informs how you think about yourself as an adult woman. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I thank you for reminding me about that book. I actually had forgotten all about it. Um, but yeah, when I first read it, I was one of those that kind of blew me away. I was like, oh, I know about this. I remember this yeah. and how, you know. 
I, I wish we could fix it. That's that's conversations we need to have is how to how to change that dynamic. I love. Have you seen the set of commercials that was done? The the ones like they took these girls and they had them throw like a girl, run like a girl. Um, seen it's like a deodorant commercial or something. I don't remember. Maybe Maxi Pad. Uh, anyway, I don't remember. But they had them. So the girls were doing this, you know, throw like that and run like. And then they're like, okay, now how about if we take that out of there and you just run like you really mean it. And they filmed this transition from taking, yeah. taking that away from them and empowering. Mm -hmm. It's so empowering. It made me cry when I watched wow. it. Commercial that made me cry. Um, and it's very much like the um, finding Ophelia, you know, um, reviving Ophelia. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really want everybody to hear the first page of your book. So, oh, great. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's do that. Um, so this is from Everyone Knows. Oh, I always can't find the camera. <laughs> Sorry, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone I know. Knows How Much I Love You by Kyle McCarthy. As many times as I've tried, I can't go back. As many times as I've sat writing at my desk, so many different desks in so many different cities, that exact moment on the road remains blank. What was in my mind? I've tried to find it. I've conjured, fibbed, faked it, and let it remain the lie in the middle of my novel, the improvisation, the patch, the cock over the crack in my memory. At the time, everyone wanted to know what I'd been thinking, and maybe lying so often lost me access to the truth. Not the truth, but the feeling. You just overshot the curve, my mom said. Was there a deer, a cop asked. Another car, his buddy guessed. They were so desperate to understand, to diminish what I'd done, decipher it. So you swerved. I did swerve, but it wasn't a flinch. It wasn't a mistake. There was a column of rage in me, a crackle of blue flame clarifying. The whole problem, as I recall, was that Leo kept talking. Leo wouldn't shut up. It was past one in the morning and he wouldn't stop talking about Lacey. And so I turned the wheel. Did I simply want to scare him? That might be too generous. But even now, all these years later, trying once again to summon the moment, all I find is static. The moment afterward, I remember. The moment afterward, indelible. Before the sirens, before the ambulance, before all the flashlights and noise and shouting, there was just a quivering hush, the trickling creak, and my beautiful boy, my best friend's boyfriend, his warm blood all over my lap. Thank you. I had goosebumps all over me. <laughs> That's just ooh, amazing first chapter. Thank you. You are so welcome. It's Thank brilliant. you. Um, so let, let's talk about this too. Where can readers find you? You do not have a Facebook page. I know. I'm a little, it's, um, I've been sort of proudly anti-social media for a long time. Oh. But I have to say the uh, pandemic is really making me revisit that because I so love meeting people face to face and emailing and sort of more intimate correspondence but it's tough in these days it is and it's and it's hard it's hard for readers to you know be able to connect with you if um if we don't know where to find you but you do have a website um i do have a website and um there is a contact page and i do get those messages and as long as you don't write something too creepy i will write yeah. back yeah yeah no creepy <laughs> yeah <laughs> nothing, nothing like those creepy ones. So, and it's Kyle McCarthy. For those of you who are listening and can't see our little names up on the screen, it's Kyle K Y L E. McCarthy is M C C A R T H Y. And you're going to find her website. It's just kylemccarthy.com, I believe. Is that correct? There's actually a R, like rabbit, in between uh, Kyle and McCarthy. So, okay, so Kyle, Kyle R. R. McCarthy. Okay. Yeah. But right. it pops up. It pops up in the Google search. So yeah, yeah it does. I, I found it. So <laughs> <laughs> I went looking. So you can find her there. Do you have any other live events planned or anything? Or not live, live, but 
you know, internet live or anything like that? I think this actually marks the end of my mm -hmm. virtual book tour, but there is, um, I did do an event with Leslie Jameson at Greenlight two weeks ago and the, it's on YouTube. So um, if you if you really want to hear more, you could check it out there. <laughs> Okay, so that's awesome. And you can find the book anywhere books are sold. And again, it's called Everyone Knows How Much I Love You by Kyle McCarthy. And I believe we're going to hear more Kyle McCarthy mm -hmm. in the future. Are you working on another one now? I am. I'm a little too superstitious to talk about it. But I, totally with you. I wouldn't either. But um, yeah. yep, yep. I'm not asking you to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. You talk about it too soon. It just uh, ruins it. I got that but just yeah. curious. So we will stay tuned for more. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. It was lovely to get to meet you. And I'm glad that I found your book. Oh, Carrie Ann, thank you so much for having me. You're so welcome. So take care. Um, bye, everybody. Read a good book. You could start with Kyle's. And I'll be back again uh, next week with another guest. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much.